Okay, so thank you very much, Isvin, for granting me this opportunity to give a presentation on the principles and practice um, on data visualization with R. And I also thank everybody for honoring this meeting and ensuring that you are all here to listen to what I have to give you concerning data visualization with R. And so I am Elijah Pia from Ghana, and I am an economist by profession. And actually, I love everything about data. So I really love R. And if you want to reach me, that is actually my email right there. And if you see, that is my picture. And I'm always smiling. And, and it is visible right here on the screen. And so usually when I walk around on campus, people do ask me, why do you always smile a lot? So I tell them that the secret behind my smile is that I can walk confidently around knowing that I know R because it's one of the most difficult statistical programming languages in the world. And so I'm just so happy because I feel so big that I know R, yeah. So the goal of this lesson is to provide you with a compact introduction to uh, data visualization techniques, and then emphasize on the strong connection between visualization and insight. So, these are the data sets we are going to use for this class. We are going to use the empty cars data set, which is actually the motor trend car road tests that was collected somewhere in the 1970s. I actually give you how to get the description of this data set because it happens to be in the base app. And it will also be using the wage one data set from the Woodridge package. And you can install it from uh, by you, you can actually import the wage one data set by in, installing the Woodridge package, but I have painstakingly um, exported it to an Excel file where we're also going to demonstrate how to import data files from Excel formats. We also use the Diamonds data set, uh, which is also found in the ggplo 2 package. I would like to give you introduction to some variables. I know some of us, are, we actually know um, these variables, but I would like to just touch on them. And I would want to reduce the variables down to a, a certain form, two categories where that would be very much easy for us to identify what sort of data visualization suits best, which variable that we are going to generate such insight. So, when it comes to the variables, there are two main categories. We have the categorical variables and we have numeric variables. So under categorical variables, we also have the nominal variables and the ordinal variables. And the nominal variables, they are the names, the labels, and the categories with no natural order. So for instance, just like it's shown on the screen, we have gender, we have countries, and a whole number of examples that you can cite. But when it comes to the ordinal variables, those are also the names, the labels, and the categories, but with an order. So, and they are usually found in Likert scales. So you would normally have on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate um, my teaching? And you also have something like, um, um, maybe you have a questionnaire, an item, and you want to seek the perception of the respondent as to whether they strongly agree uh, agree or they are neutral, disagree, and those kind of things. So we have an order with these categories, and those are the ordinal variables under the categorical variables. But when it comes to the numeric variables, we also have discrete and continuous. And the discrete ones are those that can be counted. The, those values are obtained by counting. So they are counted in finite numbers, like for instance, one, two, three, four, ten, thousand. So a typical example here is the number of cylinders, all right, of a vehicle, uh, the number of people in a room, the number of students in a class. Those are definite numbers that we usually give, and those are discrete in nature. Then we also have the continuous variables, and they are measurable within an interval. So even between uh, two finite numbers, there can be um, a lot of numbers in between within that interval. Like from one to two, you can have 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.5. 1.555 and all these sort of uh, measurement. So typical examples include height, weight, temperature, and all of that. Now, if you look at these two 
um, categories or variables that I've given, categorical and numeric, for the sake of this class, I would like to break it down to two categories where we emphasize on discrete and continuous. So we've already explained that the discrete represents the count. So if you look at the examples on the screen, we have the number of students in a class, the grade levels A, B, C, C plus, the number of blue marbles in a jar. These are all discrete variables. And the continuous variables also are measurable, measurable amounts, height, weight, temperature, distance, and all of that. So at the end of the day, now we want to move further down into ggplot2 because this is one of the best packages in our actually I, I would say it is the best package so far in our there are other packages that are supplementing because some i have come across like the gg easy it's also there to make it very easy for you to work with ggplot2 so the grammar of graphics plot is so far the by far the best package so far for powerful or creating nice aesthetically pleasing plots in R. The ggplot2 comes in layers. So I have been able to group down with the help of Hadley Wickham's textbook, uh, seven layers for the ggplot2. So we have the data, which actually happens to be the data set to be visualized. Then we have the aesthetics, and those are the scales onto which the data is mapped and we'll delve deeper. And we have the geometries, and those are the visual elements for the data. So if you are creating a scatter diagram, uh, the geometries will define the points that you see on the, on, on, on the Cartesian plane. Then we have the facet, which also allows you to create multiple plots or sub-multiples of plots. So for instance, you might happen to um, look at the category of gender, but you want to break the, the plots into male and female so you can see the distribution of for instance wage and the, maybe the years of education that they've had and all of that so facets will allow you to do that then we also have statistics and those are data representations to aid understanding so for instance you can actually look at maybe uh, a scatter diagram by the end of the day you want to generate some summaries like the mean okay then you want to show them on a graph statistics is there to help you do that then we also have the coordinates, which actually will be the space on which the data is plotted. So you can zoom into the graph, you can zoom out, you can limit your, your, your axis to a certain defined interval and all of that. The coordinates will be there to also help you out. And then we also have the themes, and those define the appearance of the plot. And that includes all the non-data ink so the way your plot should appear uh, is also defined by the themes. Now, we are going to emphasize on, because this particular lesson focuses on the principles and practice of visualization. So you should know that when you have this kind of variable, this is the type of plot that is most suitable for that. So we are going to limit ourselves to three of these layers, the first three, the data, the aesthetics, and then the geometries. And that is exactly what we are going to do. So we we'll have our data. So technically, we need the data set to be visualized. So I've given three data sets so far. Then the aesthetics, which we are going to define very soon. And then the geometries, the visual elements for the data. So the package itself is ggplot2. And the function that is housed in the package is the ggplot function. So we know that a package simply is a collection of functions, right? So inside the ggplot2, we have a ggplot function that we're going to use. So if you want to have access to this ggplot2, you actually write the ggplot2 and install that and load it in our memory in order to access the function ggplot and use it to create your plot. So it starts off with the data. We have the data, the aesthetics, and then the geometry so we are starting with the data so assuming you have we actually demonstrate that in our very soon but assuming you have installed and loaded the ggplot2 package now you can use the ggplot function and then pass in your data argument so data equals the data set that you're going to use for your visualization so i've just simply named it as df so when you actually run this code in r 
you will see this blank canvas with a gray background. That is what appears first, which is showing you that there is an effort at creating a plot. Just that you've not given it enough information to give you your visual elements on that plot. So this is what appears. Then after the data layer, we move on to the aesthetics. And those are the attributes which we give our ggplot function to define what should be on the x axis, what should be on the y axis, what should appear. Or let, let's say, for instance, you can map a variable to a certain color. You can also map a variable to a shape, to size, to fill. There are a whole lot more aesthetics, but I've included only these few. But with time, we'll get to know uh, almost a number of them. And if you want to specify these aesthetic attributes, you would have to map them in the AES function. And that AES function will have to be in the ggplot function. There are other instances where you can take it out of the ggplot function and maybe put it into the geometry. But when we get there, I will demonstrate that to you as well. So as far as we are concerned as at this point, we know that these aesthetic attributes should be passed into the AES function inside the ggplot function. So by passing in the aesthetic function so that we can go ahead and give the aesthetic attributes, we write our ggplot function. First of all, we give in our data. So data equals the DF. Then we map. So the argument name is mapping. We map the aesthetics. So at the end of the day, we now need to choose what aesthetics go into the AES function. We'll do that eventually. So let us just reduce this code a little bit because when you are writing a function in R, the order of the argument names in that function, if it follows that sequence, you can actually ignore the argument names and just pass in what you want to put in, the value themselves. Like for instance, mapping equals AES function. So you can just remove the mapping and put in the AES. So this can be done in this way and that still gives you the same sort of output that you need. It doesn't change anything, right? And we can still reduce it further by removing the data argument name and then giving the value itself, which is the DM. And that also makes the code look very short. So these are instances depends on the programmer um, who is actually doing the coding. So whichever one that the programmer prefers, you can actually do that, okay? But argument names can be omitted, all right? So Right at this point, now what we are going to do is in the empty cast data set, which is in the base R. So what we do is we have the ggplot function and then we pass in that data frame, which is empty cast, comma, then we give our aesthetics. So what we are doing is we are mapping a variable in the empty cast data set, which is the MPG. MPG is short for miles per gallon. So I will show you in R how to get a description of these variables in that data set. So we map the MPG to the X aesthetic. And when that happens, you see the grid lines in the plot, and then you see the axis ticks and tests right there. And your X axis will also be named according to the name of the variable that you specified in the aesthetic attribute. So AES, then you pass in X equals MPG and you have your your scales right there on your plot. Now, assuming that you are plotting two variables on the graph, then that means you can map one of the variables to X axis and the other variable to the Y axis. And you will see accordingly the grid lines on the plot with your Y axis giving its own default scales. And ggplot does all of that for you so you don't have to struggle in um, how your axis text and text labels should appear. So ggplot does it all for you. So we have the y axis and its scales that, that is chosen by ggplot2 and the name of the y axis, which is the hp, because that was what was mapped onto the y axis. And then we also have the x axis, uh, the, the label there, and then the axis text and then the axis tests all right there. So right at this point, the, we, need, we now need to define what the geometries do. Those are the visual elements, all right? And in short, we normally say they are called geoms, okay? So if you want to specify a geometry to add that, because if you see all the codes that we've run so far in the slides, there are no visual elements 
there are only axes or scales that are plotted for you. So you now need to define the visual limit because if you have only one variable which is mapped onto the x axis, you would want to know whether you are creating a histogram or a bar chart. So those are what are defined by the geometries. Okay, so that is the next step after that. So the geomes are specified as the geom underscore, then the type of plot that you want to create. So for instance, if you wanted to create a bar plot, then it will become geom bar. If you wanted to create a histogram, it becomes geom histogram. If you wanted to create a scatter plot, it becomes geom point. So don't worry, we'll be going into details very soon. So how do we actually write the code with geometries when it comes to ggplot2? So the geomes are just added to the preliminary code where the data and the aesthetics are specified. Okay, the code we wrote where we specified the data and the aesthetics, we just go ahead and add the geometry okay, to the function. And so if you see in that example, we had a ggplot function, we pass in our data with this empty cast, then we map the mpg variable to the x variable, and then we added our geom, which is going to present the visual element, and that is a histogram, all right? And if you see the second code as well, we also have the ggplot with our data in there and the aesthetics, where we have two variables we specified, one map to the x-axis and one map to the uh, y-axis, and then we want to create a scatter diagram. And so for that matter, we add a geom point uh, function to that, and that would also do that for us. So when we actually complete the code with one variable and a histogram, we see this is the kind of plot that appears right there in R. And then if you also wanted to create a scatter diagram, then you also have your scatter diagram also created for you. So right at this point, I would want us to go into R and then practice what we've done so far. So after this lesson, I will make available the R script and try to also use R Markdown to compile a PDF of the lesson in that order. So I'll make available the slides, the, the, a PDF using R Markdown and then the R script itself so that you can also uh, have a hands-down practice on what we've, we've done so far. So uh, we have our topic nicely done here principles and practice of data visualization with R. And we start off with the packages. So any package that we are going to use for this lesson, will just come under this particular topic and install and load, all right? I think for all the packages so far, we might need for this lesson, I have already them installed, but I write the code and I'm only going to load them using the library function, all right? So uh, first of all, we'll have to import our data sets. So I want us to import all three data sets into R so that when we are using them, we find it very easy to do so. So we start with the empty card from the base R. Because it happens to be in the base R, you only use the data function to import it. So all you have to do is write data and then pass in your empty cards. Sometimes it can be in double code. Sometimes you can just ignore the code. It all works out fine. So let me zoom in a little bit. I don't know whether you can see clearly, then that is okay. But if I have to zoom in, so maybe you can indicate it and let me see. It so, is fine, we can see it. All right, you can see it loud and clear, right? Okay. So we just go ahead and run the data on empty cast and you can see right in the environment window, it appears right there, okay? There's that there is some sort of information that needs to be present. Right now, it only shows a word, promise in angular bracket. That means unevaluated response or something. So all you have to do is to pretend as if you are calling out the data frame and you'll see the information you need right there. So let me come into the console and type the first three letters of the data frame and watch what happens in the environment window. So MTC, right. So now we have the information right there. I'm not calling out the entire data frame in the console. So I'm just trying to deceive R into thinking I'm, I'm, I, I wanted to print the, the data frame. So I get the, the preview of what is contained in that data frame. And we have 32 observations and then 11 variables in this data frame. 
if you really want to know the description of this data frame, then all you have to do is to write help function and pass in the data frame. So you can say help empty cast, or you can simply write a question mark and then your empty cast. And this two will actually give you information about, so info about data frame. And then this one also does it. Right, so let's run this one. And right here in this window, we can see the description of the data frame, which happens to be the motor trend car road test, which was the kind of data that was extracted from a 1974 motor train US magazine. All right, and if you go further down, you can see the description of the variables right there, where MPG represent the miles per US gallon the CYL represent the number of cylinders. So I'll leave it to you to go through and see what it is all about, right? So let's go ahead and also import the wage one data frame from the Woodridge package and also from the Excel file. So I've created a folder on my desktop where the Excel file is right there. But in order to import a data file from Excel, you would have to use the read XL package. So first of all, you go ahead and install using install.packages function, and then wrapped in double quotes, you just pass in the name of the package. So read XL. If you want to use the manual process of installing packages, you can just come into the bottom right window and just go to the packages tab and simply click on install where a dialog box appears okay i think because i'm sharing the screen specific to the r studio it is showing up somewhere else okay right now it is on the screen i believe you can see it the install packages dialog box can you see it on the screen all right yes yes it's visible. okay so you just go to this test box underneath uh, packages and just simply type the name of the package. So read, and if you have a very good internet connection, you have a, um, an IntelliSense, a list of all packages that are matching the first two, three characters of the package you want to type. So as you keep on typing, it will narrow down to what you are actually looking for. So we have the read Excel here. You can type to complete it or just simply click on this one to auto-complete and then simply go ahead and click on install. Now, because I already have this package installed onto uh, my computer, then I don't need to install it now. But if you are doing it from your end and you don't have it, you can actually go ahead and execute this code, or you can go through the install packages dialog box and install this package. So let me cancel it right here and go back to my R script. So after installing a package, all you need to do is to load the package in memory. So right now, after installing the package, it only enters into the systems library, right? But then in order to access the functions that are housed in this package, you will need to load it in our memory to access those functions. So all you have to do is to use the library function and then pass in the name of the package that you have installed, which is the read Excel. If you did not want to use the library function or the code, the manual way to do this is by going to the packages tab at the bottom right hand corner of the window and just simply scroll down until you're able to locate the package that you need. So I will just scroll down to the R session. Right, so we have it right here, read Excel file. So the read Excel package and the description on the right hand side. So um, you just have to check this box to load it uh, into our memory. So you can either run this code or you can simply come to the packages and just simply check the box on the left-hand side of the package. And when I check the box in the console, you can see the library function with the read Excel package right in there, actually executed. So you have everything that you need to now do this. Now the function, 
that happens to be in the read Excel package. Um, I would want you to pardon me for a moment. I would like to copy the installed or packages code and then take it up there to packages because I've created a session for that. So that in case we are installing a package, you have to bring it up here. So I have, so if you have the script, you know that these are the packages that were required for this lesson to be complete. So let me go back there. But over here, I think I can just allow the loading of the package to be. So library is just there. So that will just go ahead and use a function in the read Excel package, which is read underscore Excel. And one wonderful thing about RStudio is anytime you type a function, it would give you a label on top of the, uh, where the cursor is blinking, there is a label that appears to show you uh, an overview of all the arguments that you might need. Uh, but technically, we only need the very first argument name, which is called path. So once we're able to feed the path into the read Excel function, it's able to read our data frame from the Excel format. Now, one of the easiest way um, to actually read uh, data files into R is after you have written the function for reading the data frame, you have to pass in another function because there are two ways of doing this. You would have to go and copy the file path. That is one way. So you, you just go and copy the file path and paste it right in here in double code. That is one of the ways. Another way is to set your working directory to the folder containing your data frame so that you can now use the name of the data frame directly in the function and you will be able to import this data frame. But one of the ways I find it much easier to do is by passing in a function which is called file.choose, which when executed opens up a dialog box that allows you to navigate your way manually to where the folder is located on your computer and just click on the data frame to import it. And this is very easy. So after I have imported, I would like to save it in, I, I would like to save it in an object. So let me just call it wage like this. So I'll save it in the object called wage. So once I highlight this and execute, then the window appears so that you can now manually search through because this is very easy for us. We've been navigating on our computer a lot. So once you have this, I have it on my desktop, so I will just go there. And then I have the R mentor class. So I'll Sorry, I can't hear you again. I can't hear you, you're not audible. All right, um, can anybody else confirm if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Yes. I can, I can hear you. Okay, so yes, I guess no, there no, must no, be no, some kind of... Well, I think we can hear you, but the problem is we cannot see your um, folder file because like you're not sharing your whole screen. So All right, be all right. Okay, I think that is one of the... Sorry, so let me share my whole screen now so that you can see everything right there. All right, so I'm sharing my whole screen. Let me, let me leave and come back. Probably if I leave and come back, next up will be better. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, so let me re-execute this line of code. Right, so that the select file dialog box appears. And now I can just go to desktop and I have a folder named our mentor class. So I'll double click to open it up. And now I have my wage uh, uh, data file in, in Excel format. So I'll just click on that and simply click on open. And then you have your data frame imported. So you can see in the environment window, the way that appears with 526 observations and 24 variables right in there. So if you did not want to go through all that process, then you would have to go and copy the file path and replace the file or choose with a file path in double quotes. If you are comfortable with this, process for importing the Excel data file, then I can just proceed. But if you want me to demonstrate the other ways of doing so, I can also do that as well. 
Um, can you demonstrate other ways as well, like in case this does not work? Yeah, all right. So let me just go to my desktop. Now, this is the folder that I've created for it. So I have to open the folder, right? So we can see our data file right here. Now, just go to the test box, which contains the name of the folder. Just click in there, and then it would give you the entire file path, right? But don't forget that the name of the data file itself is wage, which happens to be in an XLSX format, because we have, with Excel files, we have XLS, which happens to be the 1997 to 2003, there are about the older versions of Excel. And if you have the 2006 upwards, I think that one would be XLSX. But the read Excel function from the read XL package can import both data files, whether it is an older version of Excel or any of the latest versions of Excel, right? So all I have to do is to click right here and I have the entire file path. Another way to also grab your file path is by right clicking on the data file and simply going to properties from the menu options. And then you can have your location where you have the entire file path. So you can just highlight and copy, right? Or you can just press down on Control C to copy it manually. So once that is done, you just have to come back to R. And then, for instance, you can just write the code. I'm going to store it into wage. So I'm going to say read Excel. And then in double code, you just paste in the file path, the entire file path. But R is able to read file path using the forward slash, the single forward slash, not the backslash. So you have to change this to the single forward slash. If you want to maintain the backslash, you have to make it double. So for instance, um, let me just copy this line of code and paste it down here so that I can maintain this. So you make it double backslash, R will be able to read your directory read through the directories and then or you change the backslash to a single forward slash like that so there is one thing that is left the name of the data file so now i have to extend the directory and just type oops inside the double quote so just type wage.xlsx like that and here too the double backslash wage.xlsx right so let me name this object as wage one and this one as wage two afterwards i will remove it from the environment window and maintain the very first one we imported so you know that these actually work so if i highlight this line of code and then I run, then you can see right in the environment window, the wage one data frame, which also has the same 526 observations and 24 variables. So it worked really fine. Then if you were using the double backslash as well, I can just place my cursor on any part of the line or just highlight the entire line and also run it as well. And then we have the wage two right there. And since the wage, wage one and wage two happens to be the same data frame, I would like to remove the wage one and wage two so we work with the wage. So what I'm going to do is to use a function called RM. RM is short for remove and just pass in the what object you want to remove from the environment window. So I'm just going to say wage one and then remove wage two. So let me just say RM is remove. So RM is short for remove, right? Removes objects from environment, right? 
So by executing this line of code, which one is gone, which two is also removed. Now we have the which, that is what we need. So these are just other ways of also importing your data file. Then we also have to import the diamonds package. But before we actually move on to importing the diamonds data frame from the ggplot2 package, um, with the wage data frame, there is a package called Woodridge, which has the data frame in there. So if you wanted to also import that data frame, then we'll have to install that package. So let me go to the packages section and just type install the packages, then in double quotes, Woodridge like that. So you go ahead and install, but I have it installed. So I will just proceed with the library. So library to load it to our memory. So Woodridge right there and just execute. So Elijah, once I think, I think, I think you are going very quickly. Oh, right. We don't, I think we cannot catch up with you. Okay. So I'll, I'll slow a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Right. So um, the wage data frame is also in the Woodridge package. So all you have to do is install the package using this code, or you could have gone through the manual process I showed you earlier. Then once the package is installed, then you can load it in our memory. So you can have access to the data frames in there. There are a lot of data frames in there. So you just run this code library, and then you pass in the package Woodridge. So once that is read, you can now use your data function. And then you can have the data frames displayed with the name of the package on the right hand side of the list. So as you can see, we have wage one, it is in Woodridge. We have wage two, it's also in Woodridge. We have wage pan, wage PRC, and a whole lot more, okay? But the data frame we have imported is wage one, right? So you can just go ahead and click on this to autocomplete. Like I said, in the data function, the name of the data frame can be in double quotes, or you can just simply ignore the double quotes. It all works fine. So then you can execute this line of code and it will be imported but it will retain the name of the data frame, which is wage one. But we have chosen to name it wage earlier on. So that is also another way of importing this data file. Have question in the chat. All right, now to import the diamonds data frame, we would also have to install the ggplot2 package as well and load it in our memory. So I'll go to the packages section and type install the packages. Then in double code, I just have ggplot2. I also have it installed, so I'll just go to the section where we have to import the data frame and just simply call library ggplot2. If you're also familiar with the tidyverse, you can install the tidyverse and load it as well. The ggplot2 is also housed in the tidyverse and that is okay. So we specifically need the ggplot2. So that is why I'm installing that package. So you can run this line of code and the ggplot2 package is loaded. Now the next option is to use the data function and then pass in the diamonds. And you can see right as the first item in the list that, that appears. And then we have the data and then we have diamonds. So by running this code, then we can also see the diamonds we can see the diamonds data frame right there. But like I said, it is not yet responsive, so I just need to pretend to R 
that I want to print the data frame. So I'll just type D I A M exactly. So once the data frame appears, you can see in the environment window the entire data frame with the uh, overview appearing. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Like I try to like. Like I am for me, uh, I I'm not able to import the file. Like it is not coming on my uh, global environment. Can I share the code with you in the chat, and you can just let me know where is my mistake? Because I. All right. Which of the data files are you finding it difficult to import? Like I'm trying to import it from the like uh, Excel file, the one oh, which wow. you shared. And I wrote the code like that only like uh, minus directly e directly e directly. But when I try to execute this code, I'm not able to get any like any any. Uh, my data is not imported into the global environment. I All don't right. know where. Uh, so uh, which of these codes are you using to import the Excel data file? I I I use both the codes like with wage and wage one. So, but one? none of this is working. Yeah, like I use page one to like with, with the double uh, with the backslash and with the forward slash. I try to use with both of them, but uh, it's not working. All right. So, um, if I am guessing it right, then perhaps you would have to have your own file path, right? Maybe. Are you trying to repeat my code here because my computer? No, 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 no. I, right. I, if you see the chat, if you see my chat, I have shared the code with you. Okay. Then just uh, a second. Like I can share it again. All right, I'm seeing it right here. Yeah. So this is I don't know where why it is not showing in my global. Form. Okay, yeah. okay. So what I'm seeing right here is okay, the weight data set code class dot x l s x. Oh, okay, but have you set your working directory to yes, the my folder? Working directory is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then that means we will not we will not need the the source. Path, the source file path, which is the E there, okay. right? So just take out. So for instance, just make it wage read underscore. I cannot see your screen. And I cannot then, see your screen. Yeah. So I'm writing there. I just said code class dot X L S X. I cannot see your screen. We cannot see I'm just putting it in, into the chat. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, like that. So, like, because I have said E as my working directory, that's why it was not working. Surely, if your working directory is a folder containing this data set, then yes, it will, it will work. If this is the name that you've given your data, data file. So check it out. Um, if you allow me, I have a comment. I think for everybody, they can go to the Excel sheet, okay. uh, press press shift, right click, copy as path. The easiest way, I think. Yes, that is very true. Uh, yeah, press shift, right click, click uh, copy as path. Yeah, yeah. I hope you get it, Ishvin. Right. You can go ahead. I, I will try in the meantime. All right. Okay. If you are still not able to get it, maybe you just go through the, the package. Um, that for sure you will get it. Maybe later on I can just I attend to you personally. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, we've also imported the diamonds data frame. So we have all three data frames imported. All right, so now we do some coding. So we start with the layers for the ggplot 2 package. And it starts off with the data, then the aesthetics and the geometries. And these are the three so far that we said we are going to focus on. So let's start with the data. 
So we initiate our ggplot function and then we pass in the data. So we say data equals, then the name of the data frame. So we are using the empty cast data frame. Like that. You can shorten this code to ggplot and just pass in your empty cast like that without the name of the argument data. So these two are actually the same. So just by executing one of them, you would see what appears in the plot window. So let me drag my window to the right a little bit and just execute this line of code. Let me clear my console to have a blank workspace. And now I can execute. And then we see a blank canvas with a gray background in the plot window right here. So we fed our ggplot function, our data frame. The next thing to do is to pass in the aesthetics. So we go ahead and grab the function. So ggplot data equals empty cast. Sorry, before you go far, All what right. is the in between these ggplot and ggplot2? Yeah, the ggplot2 is the name of the package. The ggplot is the function in ggplot2. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So ggplot, then we feed our data. Then we map our aesthetic. So we say mapping equals AES function. You can even see the label right at the top x comma y comma and then the ellipsis so let's give it x equals one of the variables in there now because i am familiar with the variables so maybe i would be i would just be, I ask, sorry 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 yep. to cut you again all right you did ggplot data it was to empty cars yes and you call the empty cars yes. so why did we have to write data equal to empty cars first why do Actually, you just do ggplots empty cars? Yeah, they are the same. They will do the same thing for you. Um, we have instances where normally this is the name of the argument that you are going to pass into the ggplot function. But the thing is that because this happens to be the first argument name in the ggplot function, if you pass in the name of the data frame directly, then R is able to know that the empty cast you have passed in there is, is, is the value for the data argument. So you can choose to write it out explicitly by saying data equals empty cast. Or you can just go ahead and say empty cast without writing the data equals. So they're actually the same thing. So I'm just trying to introduce you to some of the fastest ways of writing code as an R programmer, right? So that it's not all the time you have to be writing out various argument names. If you know the argument names following that order, you can choose to ignore the argument names. Do you get it? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So these are actually the same thing. I will do the same thing down here and make the code shorter. So just to make the code shorter, that is why I did this. All right, so right here, the data equals empty cast. Then mapping equals the AES function. And in the AES function, which happens to be the aesthetic attributes we need to pass in there, we are mapping the variable MPG to the X aesthetic, X axis. And so I was about saying that if I go ahead and write the MPG and map it to X, I am being biased here because I really know this data frame. I've worked with it. So how do you then know? So if you want to know um, what sort of variables are contained in the empty cast data frame, you can just come to the environment window and click on the empty cast, the name itself. If you click on the blue button on the left-hand side, that will expand some sort of information beneath the data frame which gives you overview of the type of data that the variable is. Like for instance, you can see we have MPG and it's a numeric data type. 
and the first few observations. Okay, so this just like reporting to you the structure of the data frame. Okay, so that is what this blue button does. So if I click back on the blue button, it collapses it back in. All right, but if you click on the name of the data frame, like empty cast here, then it opens right in the script window the data frame in a tabular format where you can see everything head on. So we have the MPG, we have CYL, we have DISP, we have HP. And then I explained earlier that if you want to know the description for all these variables, all you have to do is to execute the code help function and pass in the name of the data frame. And I will help you to give you the whole, uh, the, the sort of information you need to know what this data frame is all about. So sometimes, um, because, well, okay, let me just do it. If we were doing some sort of data analysis all throughout the process, then I have to go through all of these um, exploratory data analysis. So what I might want to do is, let me come into the console and I might perhaps use the str function, which happens to give you the structure of the data frame. So str, then you pass in the name of your data frame, so empty cast. And when executed, you see the structure of the data frame. It tells you it is a data frame object with 32 observations and 11 variables. And then the name of the variables, as well as their data types, and you can see they are all numeric data types. So we see the NUM for short, and then the first few observations that R can display for you in the console. So the, if we were doing exploratory data analysis, then this is the process I might have gone through. Another way you can also get to see your variables in the data frame is to use the names function, N-A-M-E-S, the names function and passing your data frame, MT cast, and that will just print out the names of the variables in the data frame. So if I execute this, you can see your variable headers all displayed for you. So I am only choosing the very first variable, which is MPG. That is miles per US gallon. And then I am mapping that to the S axis, the aesthetic X. So let me shorten this code a little bit. So it's the same thing by writing this, GG plots, then I will just omit the name of the argument and just give the value itself. So empty cast like that. But the AES function must be there, but you can ignore the mapping equals. You can just ignore that and just go straight to the point AES. And then inside the AES, you can now map your MPG to X. That is if you want to be explicit enough to let people know that your MPG is mapped to the X axis, then of course, this is how you do it. But because it is some kind of an order where in the aesthetic function, the AES function, there is X followed by Y. So it means that if I also remove the X aesthetic and just pass in the MPG, R automatically knows that the MPG should be mapped to the X axis. So your code now looks much shorter than before. However, it doesn't spoil anything for you to write everything explicit like it's done here. So everything is now up to you as a, as a programmer, all right, to adopt whichever uh, method that you want to write your code. So by executing any of these, now, because we have um, given an X aesthetic to the variable MPG. By executing it, you can see in the plot window that scales are chosen for that variable and they are shown on the plot. So later on, we'll look at how the geometries also come to be, the visual so elements of the plot. 
Sorry, let me draw you back. All right. Empty cas, empty cas on that GG plus now. What's the display we are seeing? Where is empty cas in all of this? Because I'm trying to understand. Is it the X axis? I can see empty G. Yep. But empty cas, where where is it? Is it what's the um, I'm trying to understand what is written and the outputs. So can yeah. you just uh, please help me with it? All right. So the whole focus about this DG plot function is that you want to create a visualization. So for instance, we are targeting creating a histogram for MPG. And that has to be placed inside the AES function right here. So we just go ahead and say something like, just um, pardon me to write this code. So for instance, we just go ahead and say AES x equals MPG. So by writing this, ggplot has no idea about what you're talking about. It doesn't know where this MPG is coming from. So the only way ggplot can know where this MPG is coming from is by giving the first argument, which is the data. So you go ahead and say data equals empty cast. So you know what ggplot does? ggplot is able to read it too. Okay, you fed me a data argument, which is empty cast. So all you are telling ggplot is to try and locate the empty cast data frame that you have imported into our workspace. So by giving this sort of information, it now knows which data frame you are entering. Then by now specifying your aesthetic attribute, which is the X equals MPG, ggplot is able to know that this MPG happens to be in this empty cast data frame, and then goes ahead and dump this and choose a scale um, um, to show you on the plot. Without the data frame, ggplot would not know where the MPG is coming from. So that is a, that is the reason why we have to bring the empty car. So the whole idea about this is that when you have specified your data frame, R is not going to show you your, because your, your data frame is large enough containing a whole lot of variables, right? It has, how many variables are in the empty cast data frame from the overview? We can see it has 11 variables. So by just specifying the empty cast in the ggplot function right now, R doesn't know which of the variables you want to plot. So that is why it gave you a blank canvas when we executed this, this sort of function. So it's just trying to tell you that, okay, you are trying to create a, a graph. I've given you a blank canvas. However, what variable within the data frame do you want to plot? And that is why we have to go further to the second layer, which is the aesthetics and give it. So R goes into the data frame and then it's able to understand that this MPG is there. And if it finds it there, it can now give you a scale on the plot. So remember that when we execute this one, it is just a blank canvas with nothing showing because ggplot is now confused. It doesn't know what you want to do with this data frame yet. So it only says, okay, fine. You've given the first layer, understood. So I have given you a blank canvas. So you want to create a graph. Okay, I've given it to you. Now, in order to force ggplot to give you the visual element, you go ahead to the aesthetics. So you say, okay, ggplot, I want my x axis should be the variable mpg. So you go ahead and specify the AES function and map your MPG to the X axis. And so once you do that and execute, now ggplot understands that and gives you the scale that you've asked it to, to create for you. Once the scale has been created, now you need to tell ggplot that I want to create a histogram. And that is when the geometry comes in, All right? So that is where we are now moving on to. Are you okay with that? Very okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Okay, so I can clean this code now. So now we've given it this aesthetic. That is why we have this here. Now we are going to also write another code where we have two aesthetic attributes, the X one mapped onto the X axis and the other mapped onto the Y axis. So, and let's see how that also works out right there. So because here is just the data, we are just okay. So down here, I'm just going to say ggplot, then data equals empty cast. 
mapping equals the AES function. We map the MPG to the X axis. And there is another variable. Let's use think, displacement, all right? So Y equals DISP. So MPG and displacement, DISP. So we are mapping the MPG variable to X and DISP to Y. Yes, Isvin. I have a question that, uh, that uh, like this is a large data set, like it has 11 variables. So how do we decide that which one to map on X and which one to map on Y? So like if I'm analyzing the big data set and how we should be in further? That's a very wonderful question. Now, at this point, what we are doing right now is to understand the first part of the slides I just showed. Um, which happens to be the three layers. So we are just looking at the feeding, the ggplot function, the data. Now we will feed it the aesthetics, and then we are now going to feed it the geometry. Once we understand these three layers in creating our wholesome graph that we want, I will go further into the slides and I'll show you which type of plots or the various visualization techniques that we can do. So when do we have to create a bar plot? When do we have to create a histogram? a dot plot, a frequency polygon, and all those sort of plots that we have. So after this, um, this demonstration, we'll go back to the slides and then I'll show you what is next so that you can decide if you have a data frame, you can decide on what sort of visualization can give you the insight you need. All right. So here, just benefit of the doubt, we're just choosing any sort of variables we can find. All right, okay. So MPG and then DISP, and I can shorten the code this way, ggplot, and I just pass in the name of the data frame. And then in the AES function, I can just say MPG comma DISP, that's all. So it knows that the MPG is mapped onto the X axis and then the DISP is mapped onto the Y axis. Any further aesthetic that you are going to specify should be clearly specified. Like for instance, you can say color equals this variable, shape equals this variable. But we are yet to move further into the various aesthetic attributes, all right? So let's just limit ourselves to the X and Y aesthetics. So now by executing this line of code, we will see a default scale chosen for the variable MPG on the X axis and a default scale chosen for DISP variable on the Y axis. So you can see right there in the plot window. So the only thing that is missing is what sort of plot do you want to create, all right? Now, if you look at the values for MPG on the X axis and the values for DISP on the Y axis, they are sort of continuous data. I'm going to show you what sort of graphs you can create for uh, what type of variable it is, right? Yes. Ritupana, yeah, you can ask a question. You raise up your hand. Your microphone is muted. Or was it by accident? I think you have, you have a message on the, the chat box. On chat. Okay, all right. So now we would like to know what sort of graph we want to create. Basically for the first code here where we only mapped the MPG to the X axis, we want to create a histogram. So if we come to the geometries, what I want to do is to copy this code, all right? And now I have to add the geometry to, to define the visual element I want to see on the plot. So after writing the code where you've passed in your data and your aesthetics, now you need to add your geometry. So all you have to do is to put a plus sign and add your geometry. So if we want to create a histogram, then I'm just going to say geom histogram. Let me pull this a little bit to the right. 
like that. So I've just added this geometry to the code. So what this is happening is, what is happening right now is, we have the ggplot function, we've given it a data frame, we've shown R and ggplot to go into this data frame and pick the mpg variable and map it to the x-axis. Once that is done, I am adding this geom histogram to tell the ggplot to now create a histogram for the code. So right now, if I just go ahead and execute, then we have our histogram right there. So usually maybe the code looks a little bit longer. So I will just break it. So once after the plus sign, I will just break it to the next line, All right? So like uh, by default, like we did not mention why, uh, like we did not mention anything about why. So it will take count on the y axis, right? Come again. Like uh, you did not specify what it should take on y axis. Like you did not specify anything for y, so it will take count, right? Exactly. So you know the type of plot that you want to create is dependent on what information you give it. If you want to create a histogram, what it does is it takes in only one variable, which is a continuous variable, all right? And that is able to create a histogram for you. Now, the idea is why histogram? Histogram lets you know the distribution of your, of your variable, whether it is normally distributed or not, all right? That is the reason behind creating a histogram. So if you look at this one, you can see that um, it's difficult to tell that this is a normal distribution. And it's also difficult to tell whether this is positively skewed or negative skewed, right? So you just give you an idea about, yeah, that is what visualization is all about, okay? So if you believe that the histogram is not showing you what you really want to give out there, then you can look at other plots that can give you the sort of information. Maybe a frequency polygon is also there, all right? A dot plot is also there. So there are so many visualizations and we are going to go to we are going to go through those visualizations, right? But um, for now, all we are all we are just doing is um, uh, okay. Let me just say I'm showing you how to feed your ggplot function its data, an aesthetic, and then a geometry. All right. So when we are done, now I'm going to show you that if you have this particular variable, this particular type of variable, then this is the sort of visualization you can create for it to generate your insight. So we'll, we'll really come to that one, okay? All right. Just, 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 just sorry to interrupt you, like Ritu Parna asked in the chat, okay. if on X axis, if, if, if on X axis, I want two variables, is, and like, is it possible? Yeah, like, in actual sense, if you are creating a kind of plot that actually uses um, a single variable, like just like this one was mapped to the x-axis. It is just going to use the frequencies, okay? Um, it, it will present the count of the values in the MPG variable and create the bars to let you know that distribution, all right? So that is why on the y-axis, it by default, it names it as count. So it's only telling you the, the number of 15s, the number of 10s and those things to show you the distribution in there, yeah. But if we specify two variables in there, then um, you, you, you cannot create a histogram for two variables, especially two continuous variables. Exactly. So what you have to do is, what are you trying to achieve by giving two variables? Maybe do you want to look at the relationship between those two variables? Then what kind of plot can look into the relationship? Then a scatter diagram comes into the scene. So if you want to create that scatter diagram, then what geometry can create it, the geom point. So I'm going to grab this, um, this code where I've specified two variables. And maybe like I said, the idea is to look into the relationship between these two variables. So I'm just going to add my geometry, which is simply the geom point for creating a, hist um, a, a, scatter, a scatter plot, sorry. So by running this code, now you can see that your MPG is on the x-axis, your DISP is on the y-axis because that is what you fed your ggplot function. And your geom point has 
displayed the points, okay, the scatter points on the graph for you to establish that relationship. So if you know, um, if you know visualization, then you can clearly tell that this happens to exhibit a negative relationship. So the interpretation is another thing. Uh, uh, we, we, we will look at that, okay? Right, so for now, what I wanted you all to understand is that for the first three layers of ggplot2 package, we have the data, we have, we have the aesthetics, and then we have the geometries. So I'm just showing you how to feed data to your ggplot function, how to feed aesthetics, basically the x and y axis, or just the x axis and those things. And then you also know how to add a geom layer that is going to give you the visual element on the plot. Once you understand this, now let us go back to the slides and learn what sort of visualization would suit the kind of variable you are working with. All right, so we are going back to the slide. So before I move away from here, I would like to know if you all get what it means to pass data, pass aesthetics, pass geometries in the ggplot function to create plots. That is just what I want to know. If you're okay with that, then we're just moving on to the slides. Yes. All right. So, um, so and, uh, you, yep. and one more thing. You said that today's class will be for one hour and 20 minutes. So I just said uh, today's uh, Zoom meeting till one hour, 30 minutes. So the Zoom meeting will end at 9.30. Ishwin, your sound is not clear. Um, I'm saying that uh, since you mentioned that today's class will be for one hour and 20 minutes, so just a heads up that the Zoom meeting will end at uh, like after 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, let's proceed from here. When it's about 10 minutes, let me know so I know how to um, keep up my pace. Yeah, so like it's only 15 minutes left. All right, okay. All right. All right, so we are now looking into the variables and the various plots that we can create, actually um, specified by the geometries in the ggplot2 function. So now let's start with one variable. So you have your data frame, you want to actually create a visualization that gives some kind of insight to, to people out there, right? You want to communicate that sort of information. So if you just want to look into one variable, just one variable, now just determine which category this variable falls in. Is it a discrete variable? Is it a continuous variable? That is a question you ask yourself. If it is a discrete variable, now remember, that discrete variable we said, the accounts, gender. Um, you can even have uh, 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 the Likert scales on a scale of one to 10, because those are finite counts, all right? So discrete variables, then one of the best visualization to show is a bar plot. And that means the geometry in the ggplot2 function to create that bar plot is the geom bar, because you understand what it means to pass in data to the ggplot function, you understand what it means to pass in the aesthetic. And that aesthetic is going to be the one variable which is discrete in nature, all right? Then the type of plot to create for a discrete variable is going to be the bar plot. Another one is pie chart, but data visualization experts have actually declared that pie chart is one of the worst ways of um, communicating discrete uh, representation. So that is why I have chosen to ignore uh, pie chart. And also one of the very reasons why there is not a geometric layer for creating pie chart. You have to uh, modify some of these ones like from the bar, geom bar, and then you can create a pie chart out of that by using a, the other layers from, I think the statistics there about, yeah, but we are limiting ourselves to data, the aesthetics and then the, and then the, geom, the geometries. So right here, if you have one variable and it is discrete, then you create a bar plot, all right? So if you have one variable 
and it is continuous. Continuous means they are given, they are measurable in a given interval, all right? Temperature, the height, the weight, the age, because with age, they are not just finite count, like 21 years, 22 years. You can have 21 years and some months. So you can have 21.4. Yes, of course, somebody can be 21.4 years of age, all right? So age is also a continuous variable. So now, from all the data frames that we have actually imported into R, let's go look for variables that are discrete and then we create a backlog, that's all. Then after that, we will try to locate which variables are continuous and we can create a histogram, a density plot, a dot plot, or a frequency polygon, right? So let's start with the discrete. I have actually given the, uh, the meaning behind these geometries in the next slide. So the geom bar, it displays distribution of discrete variables. The geom histogram will be in and count continuous variables and represent them with bars. The geom density will give a smooth density estimate. And then the geom dot plot will stack individual points into a dot plot. And then the geom freq poly will pin and count continuous variables like the geom histogram, but this time around with lines instead of bars. So I've just given the description and, and, and any slide where you see uh, this sort of uh, tabular representation, I've given the meaning behind those geometries in the next slide. So right here, let's go look for one variable that is discrete and then create bar plot for that. So let's go to R. So the types of variables and the associated plots, one variable that is discrete. Now, let's look at the first six observations of the empty cast data frame. So if I execute, MPG is continuous because we have 21.0, 0, 22.8 and those things. So this continuous variable, the CYL, hmm, six, four, six, eight. Okay, finite count. So why don't we look at the values in the CYL column, all right? So how to do this? If you want to access this column from the empty cast data frame, then you write the name of the data frame followed by the dollar symbol, then you can see a list of the columns there and select which one that you want to display. So we are looking for CYL. So I use the down arrow key to select it, press enter to auto complete. Now that I've accessed the variable, I want to display what values are in that column, all right? So I'm going to use the unique function, unique function, right? So if I execute this, wow, we have six, we have four, we have eight. CYL means the number of cylinders of the car, according to the description. So at the end of the day, it means that we only have uh, cars with six cylinders, cars with four cylinders, and cars with eight cylinders. So this is what we call discrete. Although it has not been given name, it has not been given a label, all right? It is still categorical in nature and has finite count, so it's discrete. So at that point, then I can go ahead and say, GG plot, we are going to create a bar plot. So look at what is going to happen. So I go into the empty cast data frame. Okay, let me be explicit enough by saying data equals empty cast. Then in the aesthetics, I am going to map the CYL to the x-axis. Once that is done, then I'm now going to create a bar plot by adding the geom bar. And if you execute that line of code, you now have a bar plot of that variable. So you are able to know how many cars have four cylinders, six cylinders, and eight cylinders respectively. And you can see that there are a lot more cars with eight cylinders than uh, cars with, the, with fewer cylinders, right? So there's a bar plot, okay? That will give you information about discrete variables. Yeah. So, okay, then uh, you can have five minutes break and I, by that time I can create Zoom link. Yeah. And then we can start on the new Zoom link. Yeah, perfect, good idea. All right. Okay. Okay. So I'm leaving so that I can create new Zoom link. So oh, okay, perfect. We'll just leave. Okay, okay.
All right. So thank you once again. And we'll proceed with where we ended. So from the slides, we got to realize that if we are analyzing one variable, and if that variable, you need to determine whether the variable is discrete or continuous. If it is discrete, then you would know that the appropriate visualization technique for that should be a, a bar plot. <clears throat> if that variable is continuous, then you can create a histogram, a density plot, a dot plot, or a frequency polygon. So we are starting with a variable that is discrete. So we went right into R, and from the empty cast data frame, we noticed that the CYL variable is discrete in nature. And so for that matter, we just created a bar plot by adding the geom bar layer to the function. And we had our bar plot nicely created. So um, I'm not yet going into the um, customizations, the, the visual effects, the themes, and all those sort of things as in you choose the color and all those sort of things for now. So we just want to know the type of plots that we have to be creating for the various types yeah. of variables. Sorry to interrupt you. All these features have been discussed by Indrek. Yes, so He has already discussed it, so you don't need to go over them again. That is true. But you can right. teach us the concept. Yeah, OK, all right. So we have a bar plot for this discrete variable. If you go into the MTCAS data frame, we still have a lot of them, like the VS. We have the AM because the VS contains values zero and one. So if I really wanted to know what sort of values are in this column, then I could likely also go ahead with unique function and then write the name of the data frame followed by the dollar sign. And then I will just go ahead and maybe use the down arrow key to select through and locate VS or I could have typed it manually. So if I run that, then we only have zeros and ones. So this is also discrete. And for that matter, a bar plot would be most appropriate. So we just go ahead and say ggplot function, data equals empty cast. That's the name of the data frame. Then the aesthetic, we are going to map the VS to the X axis and once that is, that is done, I just go ahead and add the geom bar as well. And by executing it, we'll know how many zeros and how many ones are in that column. So you can also do same for the AM and they all have their meanings, all right? So the VS I think happens to be an engine sort of something, let's see. Yeah, that is an engine. So if it is zero, it is V-shaped. And if it is one, it is a straight engine. So if you look at the plot, then we can see that for all the cars so far we have in the empty cars data frame, there are more uh, V-shaped engines than the straight ones, right? That is also the kind of interpretation you can give it. So there are more V-shaped engines than the, the straight ones, okay? Then, Maybe if you wanted to know the proportion and report it, like for instance, maybe there is about 70% of the entire data frame, the, uh, the, the number of cars, there are 70% which are straight, straight engines or that sort of thing. So that is for another sort of data analysis that you can do uh, because we are focusing much on the visualization. Um, you could have used the table function. So this is just in person, I'm just passing it through. So the table function, and then empty cars. And then we have the VS. And if I run that, I am able to determine there are 18 cars with V-shaped engine. And there are 14 cars with um, the straight engine. If I wanted to really have the proportions, then you could use the prop.table function that will give you the proportion. So you just also pass in the empty cars, dollar sign, the VS variable, and then, oops. Okay, it has done that for each one of them. All right, how about I use the prop 
dot table for the table function. So empty cars and then VS. All right. So there is approximately 56% of the cars having V-shaped engines and 44% having straight engines, right? So these are some of the ways if you wanted to really have uh, to report them in figures. Otherwise, the visualization is just okay. And you are able to say that there are more V-shaped engines than the straight ones. So by far, this is in the empty cars data frame. So why don't we also look at the wage data frame that we have imported? So we are just looking at the first few observations and we have wage, we have education, we have experience, we have tenor, non-white, female, married, and all, all of those things. So if you look at the description in the PDF file I had sent earlier, um, for the female column, it is one if it's female, which means the zero here represents a number of males and in, in this data frame. So if I really wanted to, and it's also discrete in nature, so if I wanted to look at what insight I could give into how many males and females we have in this data frame, then I could also create a bar plot, and that is the most appropriate visualization you can do. You can create, so we have GG plot, then data equals which, then the aesthetics, I'm going to map X to female, because that is the name of the column. And then we have a geom bar, so that by running this, we're able to determine how many males and how many females we have in there. So by the look, by taking a look at the graph, we can see that there are more males than females. All right, so that is also right there. And then just to take a look at the first few observations of the diamonds data frame. So the head function that you pass in your data frame, we also have the carat, we have the cut. So the cut here is categorical, right? So this means this is also discrete. The color is also discrete. Clarity will also be discrete. This is continuous, continuous, price continuous, X continuous, Y continuous, and then Z continuous. So once um, the cut color and clarity actually qualifies to be discrete, if you wanted to generate insight into, um, let's say the color, for instance, how many colors are there in the diamonds data frame, then we can go ahead and write our function ggplot and then passing our data equals the diamonds. And then the aesthetics, I'm going to map my X to the color. And then I will add the geom bar to create a bar plot. So by running this, we're able to know uh, how, uh, I think the color G um, is a majority in this class of colors. Uh, that is how- uh, if we want to plot proportion instead of count, then how can we do that? Yeah, like so on the y axis. Absolutely. That would require some sort of uh, data manipulation at this point. Um, so far, uh, unless, of course, perhaps let me just find out whether from the zoom bar we really have something that we can do to make a proportion instead of count. Uh, so far, let's see. Uh, if you look at the argument in there, uh, there isn't specifically anything like that. So that means it will require further uh, data manipulation. If we are using tidyverse, okay, that could have been done. Um, but I believe maybe for now we are just looking at the choice of uh, the choice of plots to create. <clears throat> so maybe another time we can look into data manipulation and data analysis. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right, so that we can go much deeper. Okay, so one of the ways um, I decided to show you here, which becomes easier, so I don't have to go through all the data manipulation uh, techniques and all those sort of things to write more code, was to use the, the prop dot table and wrap it around. So like, for instance, maybe I could just say prop dot table function. Then inside that function, I'm going to write the table function again and I'm going to pass in my data frame with the diamonds and then select the color variable and run. So I will be able to determine the proportions, all right? So I can speak to that effect. So once I knew that the color G was the majority in this class, then the proportion is approximately 21% uh, 
um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The twenty-one percent of the respondents maybe might might choose the color jean as their favorite color if that is the meaning behind uh, that sort of. So that was just by the way, okay. But there are other data manipulation things that you can do with tidy verse and generic plots that will actually convey the sort of information that you need. Okay. Even there are instances where you can even create a bar plot and display the proportions on top of the bars, okay, in percentages or in counts. So they are all there. Those will require some extra data manipulation skills. All right. So the next thing that we need to look at is we are also looking at one variable, and it is continuous in nature. And so these are the various plots that we can create, the histogram, the density plot, the dot plot, and the frequency polygon. So let's look at what these actually look like here when implemented. So one variable continuous. Then I know that the MPG variable so far from the empty cast data frame is continuous in nature. So I'll just go ahead and write my GG plot function. Then data equals empty cast and the aesthetics X equals MPG. And then I will give it geom histogram. That is the first um, um, plot type that was shown in, in, in the table. So geom histogram. And you know what I want us to do? For this same continuous variable, we have the geom histogram for a histogram, geom density for density plot, geom dot for dot plot, and then geom freq poly. So why don't I just grab this entire line of code and paste them down here to see how they would look like after they executed, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and change this one to density. And so let's change this one to, what was that? Dot, dot. In, dot plot, yeah. And then the last one was frequency poly. poly. Exactly. So as long as this MPG variable is continuous in nature, all these plots will give you the sort of information you need to generate about the, the variable. So now it would be up to you to look at which one you can speak to, all right, people more about. So why don't we run this one and see? So we run the histogram and it looks like that. We run the geom density for the same variable, all right? And we see that, uh -huh. all right? And then um, as to, I think it is bimodal. <clears throat> if, you, if you know more into statistics, then you can say this is bimodal. Um, uh, not normally distributed and all those sort of things. So yeah, then we have the dot plot and let's, let's also see how that also looks like. So it also looks like the histogram, but this time around, there are big points that are stacked on top of each other to show the distribution, right? And then we have the freq poly that also looks like this. Okay, so beans and counts the continuous variable, but this time around with lines instead of the bars, okay? So it means that you just need to choose which one of them you feel you can speak to, um, to, the, to the data, all right? Good. So all of these plots are enough to give you the information you need about continuous uh, variables, okay? So if I inspect the first few observations of diamonds, okay, well, I think let's go into wage because in the wage, there is a wage column so why don't I look at the distribution of weight, right? So this is the sort of information that was, I, I think, collected for US sensor something. And so maybe I can just go ahead and say ggplot and then data equals weight. And then the aesthetic x equals the weight column because yes, there is a weight column right there. And then I am going to, create a histogram. So I add the geom histogram layer to it. And when I run this, then good, I have a histogram, which is positively skewed, all right? It is positively skewed. So you can see some outliers on, on the far right 
uh, the value 20 there about if it is 20 dollars or I, I need to you know you need to check the description of the data frame and the variables so you would know what sort of currency the wages and probably I think it would be US dollars but as to whether it's 20,000 US dollars or in the thousands or in the tens um, I have not looked into that all right so but you can see that we have uh, some values going high way to the 20 they're about okay so it is positively skewed all right somebody in the group uh, in the chat asked is it okay to show how to display the percentages as well yeah for a continuous variable um it will not pay for you to show the percentages but for a discrete variable when we created a bar plot yes it pays uh, to show that sort of graph. Uh, there is some sort of analysis I did for someone and it was nicely done. However, I will have to navigate and locate where that graph is. Maybe I'll show it later in the group uh, so you will know what it means to create powerful visualizations. They are all there. There, there, is, there, is, there is no limit to what you can do with ggplot. You can, you can change everything, including the, the panel background, the border lines, the grid lines, Anything in ggplot can be altered, all right, provided you have the necessary skills with all the layers so far for ggplot too. You can do virtually anything and create a, a, a aesthetically pleasing plots, all right. So after the class, I will send uh, one of the visualizations I created for someone um, into the WhatsApp group so you can take a look at it. And you'll see that I displayed the percentages on top of the bars and it was so nicely done. So I will, I will send it later in the group, all right. So with this, why don't we try and let me copy this and look into the dot plot and the freq poly and those things to see how the weight variable would also look like from that perspective. So we have the geom density, right? And then we have the geom dot plot. And then we have the geom break poly. So let's look at how a density plot will look like for the weight variable. Right. So you can see it's possibly skewed there to the right. All right. And then the dot plot. All right. Okay. And then the freq poly. So at the end of the day, when it comes to one variable which is continuous in nature, the most common form of plot that almost everybody uses is the histogram. Apart from that is the density plot. So if you have any reason to choose dot plot and frequency polygon, then you would have to defend it as a, as a visualization expert, right? Okay, so um, I will leave that to you as the programmer. Now you know that these plot will, will give you the information about continuous variables, then it is up to you to whether um, follow the crowd and use the histogram or, um, or, or, or use the density plot. Okay, or maybe as unique as you would want to be a dot plot and frequency polygon, and maybe you might be able to defend it or speak to the visualization. That is okay, right? Okay, so this is what I did. By giving you the description of the various geometries, then right in the slide, I said, now let's practice, but we've practiced it already. So let's move on to two variables now. So it means that by breaking it down to um, discrete and continuous, it makes it very easy for you to identify which sort of plot to create for a particular variable, right? So now we have two variables. Now with two variables, if the two variables, so we, we have a variable map to the X axis and a variable map to the Y axis. So we have X and a Y, okay? So when we specify that in the ggplot function, so we give it the data, we give it the X axis, we give it the Y axis. Then we now need to look at the nature of these two variables. If they are both continuous, then these are the geometries or the plots that you can create for it. So we have a scatter plot, we have a quantile plot, we have a wrap plot, and then we have test labels. Now I will show you the test labels really 
it's not plot, but sometimes for scatter diagrams, you see test labels right there, but I'll show you how that is also done there. Then before, af afterwards, we'll come and look at when one is continuous and one is discrete. So let's look at both continuous, all right? So I gave the description. So the geom point will, will create a scatter plot. The geom quantile will create a smooth quantile regression. The geom rag will create marginal rag plots. The geom test will give the test labels. So afterwards, when we look at the one continuous, one discrete, then we can move further down to the descriptions. And then we need to practice that too. And then we'll move on to another two variables and show different sort of things. So um, let's go to both continuous, right? Let me have it here. So two variables, both continuous. Now, let's start with the empty cast data frame, okay? So let's take the first few observations of the empty cast data frame. So I want us to choose the MPG and then the weight, wonderful. MPG and the weight of a car, all right? So the miles per gallon and its weight, if it is heavy, what? what will be the mass per gallon it can cover? If it's light in weight like that. So maybe we want to look at the relationship between the mass per gallon and the weight of a car. So now GG plot, our data is empty cars. Then with the aesthetics, X, let's map it to MPG. And then let's map the weight to the Y axis. And once that is done, then we have our first plot that we can create, which is what? Geom point, the scatter plot. So by running this line of code, then we have a very nice scatter plot right here where the MPG is on the x-axis and the weight is just there, right? So once you have this, there is a negative relationship, okay? Because you can see the sloping downwards that way. So that is a negative relationship. So which means that um, the lighter the weight of a car, the more miles per gallon it can also cover. Okay, and then the other way around. Okay, so um, I will just do my part in giving just um, a, a simple point in the explanation or in the interpretation, but uh, I know that um, all, all of you actually can give into the interpretation. Just that we now need to know what sort of plot to create and all of that. Okay, so that is a geom point for the scatter plot. Then why don't we copy the same line of code with the same set of variables? And this time around, we create a quantile, a smooth quantile regression and see what's gonna happen, a quantile plot. So by running this, we wait a little while, it's taking longer than usual smoothing function not specified using y on x so it rather run the weight on mpg and um it is actually trying to show you just like i think indrik in one of his lessons uh used the geom smooth to fit the, the a line through the the scatter plot the the points uh however this one is not geom smooth. This one is a quantile plot. And I must be frank enough to say that I have really not used this kind of visualization for two continuous variables, right? But we are just seeing it now. So like I said, when you are exposed to what types of plots you can create for your variables, then you now need to decide, because I know that if you have two continuous variables, one of the best plots that you can ever create to look at the relationship between those two variables is simply a scatter plot, all right? So we know that there is a quantile plot. We've created it and we, we've seen how it also looks like. Uh, I have a question. So why are there are three lines, like, like the relationship, like it should be one line, right? So why are there are three lines? Here? Yeah, it is going to be one line if we are fitting, uh, what, what do we call it? A, a line of best fit. It's just one line, line of best fit through. And that is, that is we need to use another geometry, okay, which is called a geom smooth. Yeah, right. One question here. Okay. All right. uh, so what's up? 
point or purpose of the this uh, function geom quantile what's in for importance of this uh, uh, function here when we when we when we run the code for the uh, like a geom smooth we, we can see the line but here the geom quantile what's the function or what's the role of this function here how to analyze it we have three lines here on the graph now yeah that is true um, so I I will not believe that this happens to be a line of best fit as in the um, as is what is displayed when we use the geom smooth. So um, maybe I think I will have to follow um, the explanation given by uh, R on that. So and if if we look at that, it, well, it doesn't give us um, the sort of information that we really need. It says the quantile regression. So he said this fits a quantile regression to the data and draws the fitted quantiles with lines. Uh, this is as continuous analog to geom box plot. Uh, well, technically, I really, I'm not able to make much sense because I think for all the visualizations I've come across, you know, one thing about uh, data visualization experts, um, yeah. there are so many plots. I think I'm also a Tableau user. Tableau has very powerful uh, graphs. By the end of the day, I think you only use one that is deemed appropriate to the to the nature of the insight you want to generate for, um, for, for people out there. So when it comes to looking at that relationship between these two variables, the MPG and the weight, uh, technically all almost all 95% of data visualization experts will choose the scatter uh, plot. But if there is one amongst the five percent that would dare to use the gym quantile, then probably they know what it really is. But personally, I I, I really can't uh, speak to that as as at this time. Yeah. So we cannot say the quantile function is a uh, comparable function like that. Yes, it is really yes, it is really comparable. At the end of the day, yeah. if you look at how the lines are generated in the plot, yeah. it is still yeah, depicting right. the same sort of information. It's a negative relationship. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. So I think That's that is so far the only thing we can generate from that, considering our knowledge in the scatter diagram and the geom smooth kind of line. So yeah. that is, yeah, that is it. But if there is more to it, then maybe it is up to us to go and find out how to interpret a quantile plot, something like that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. So the next one is a geom rag. I really want to know what that does. And like I said, I must be uh, plain enough to say that for most of the plots that are defined by the geometries, I've not really used them in any of the works I've ever done in, in thesis, in research work or anything like that. So I'm just seeing some of them for the first time, like the geom quantile, um, like that. And we also have the uh, geom rag. So I, I also, I am curious to know what that really does. So let's execute it and see what happens. So by running this, mm, and we have that over there. Maybe the geom rag, well, I must be frank enough, the interpretation will look really difficult for me. Of course, with the relationship, I'll stick to the scatter diagram, the scatter plots. <laughs> All right, and then let's look at what the geom test will do. Okay, so geom text, geom text. Geom test requires the following missing aesthetics. That is a label, a label. So that means we'll have to go one further down um, to do so. So um, what I can do is if it requires a label, and the label is an aesthetic. So I can pass that label, not in the AES function, in the ggplot function, but rather in the geom test function. So it means I need to specify another AES function inside the geom text, and then say label equals, then I need to give them labels. So how do I then get labels? Hmm. All right. If we take a look at the empty cars, if there are labels, then it has to be the cars so far. 
And these are what we refer to as the row labels, right? So we have the Mazar by four, the Datsun 710, the Hornet four drive and all those sort of things. So how should we be able to like come up with a vector of all these names? I think there is a function for that. That function is row names, row dot names, right? So row dot names, and let me pass in the empty cast data frame. Let me see if it is, it is able to fish out the row labels right here. So let's run that and see. Wonderful. It is able to do so. So row.names. All right. Okay, so if it has done that, then the label equals row.names of empty cars. So the row.names empty cars will give you the row labels which accompany the data frame. So let's pass it there and see how it appears right in the plot, if it's going to work. Let's see. So by running this, we have given it a label, wonderful. So we have this sort of plot here. So what it is trying to do is, instead of plotting the point as in a scatter plot, this one is rather um, labeling those points, right? So it still comes down to say that there is a negative relationship between the weight of a car and the MPG. So I can say that the Honda Civic right here is able to cover 30 miles per gallon, but its weight is not even up to two. Um, I, I, I've not checked the, I think if it's kilograms, let's assume that it's kilograms, okay? So the Honda Civic is not even up to two kilograms, right? And it's able to cover 30 miles per gallon. So I can say that the Honda Civic is lighter in weight than the Mercedes 450 SE like that. So this is the kind of situation you can find yourself that maybe you would want to bring in the point, okay? And if that happens, let me copy this code, paste it right here. And before the geom test, why don't I superimpose the geom point? Add it as a layer so that for x equals mpg and y equals wt there is a zoom point and there is a zoom text so that it's not just the text it is now the text and the point all together so if i do that and run this wonderful we have the points right there so we have the points in there but the graph looks some kind of rough some hazard kind of. So um, I remember there is some, there is a, an argument that will prevent this overlapping. So one of the ways I want to do this is by seeking help from R on the geom text. Let's find out. So geom text here. Yeah, there is check overlap equals false by default, check overlap. So if we look at the, the explanation to that, it says that if it is true, the test that overlaps previous tests in the same layer will not be plotted. So check overlap happens at draw time and in the order of the data. So I think what makes much sense to us is the very first uh, sentence that we find here. If true, test that overlaps previous tests in the same layer will not be plotted. So let's do that and see. So in the geom test, but outside of the aesthetic function, because it is not part of the aesthetics. The aesthetics is another uh, argument on its own. So outside of the aesthetic, let's say check overlap. Oops, um, hold on. Oh, okay, all right. So outside there, yeah, so check dot overlap equals true. And then let's see what that is on that here. So by running this, great. Now we can see those that overlap are not plotted, right? So I can boldly say that the fastest car is the Toyota Corolla right here, right? And its weight is around two, <clears throat> assuming the unit of measurement is kilograms, its weight is around two kilograms, right? And then, the heaviest car is the Lincoln Continental, 
right? And that also is able to cover around 10 miles per gallon. So now if you want a faster car, then you probably should be going for the Honda Civic, the Lotus Europa, and then the Toyota Corolla. But if you want the heaviest car, then you should be thinking about the Lincoln Continental, right? So these are some of the ways that we can speak to the, to the data. There are so many things that we can do um, with plots, uh, but at least once I encountered the geom text, you notice that I needed to know that in order to fish out the, the row labels, I had to use a function called row.names. That is why I implemented that right here separately to know that it really works. And then I was able to gather the, the labels, all right? And then I pass it to the label um, aesthetic inside the AES function in the geom test function, and it's able to plot our text for us uh, for the MPG against the weight. Now, before I proceed, I would like to go a little bit back and show you something. When we plotted the bar plot for the cylinder variable in the empty cast data frame, you notice that this was mapped to the X axis, right? So we have the vertical bars, but you can change the aesthetic to Y. So let me just copy this and bring it down here and just change it from X to Y. So here, assuming that we have not given an X aesthetic, we have only given the Y. When you do that, it only flips the, the bars, making it horizontal rather than vertical. So if you run this, like that. So if you wanted to also create a horizontal bar plot, you just um, switch the aesthetic, all right? If you go further to the coordinate system, uh, because in the layers, we mentioned that there is a facet, we have statistics, we have coordinates. Then there is a function called chord flip that can flip um, the axis, okay? So making the X the Y axis and the Y the X axis like that. But the X and Y aesthetic for a single variable will do just that for you. So if you wanted to create a horizontal uh, bar plot, then this, of course, you can only uh, map your variable to the Y axis rather than the X axis. So let's continue. All right, so now if you have two variables and one of them is continuous and the other is discrete, then you can use the geom call or you can still use the geom bar, but this time around, you specify an argument call stat and set it to identity. So the geom call will just do it for you. We'll implement both of them to see how they work. If it is one continuous, one discrete, you can also create a box plot. And you can also create a violin plot. So let's look at this type of plots in, in R. So two variables, one is continuous, one is discrete. So how do we fish for, um, let's do that and see. Well, let's go into the wage data frame. I think we'll get something like that where we have the wage. So let's pick the wage, which is continuous in nature. And female, um, actually, you know, you can, okay, let, let's, let's help ourselves right here. Okay, a little bit cleaner. Now, this female label, I would like to change it to gender. That would be much better. I would like to change it to gender. So what I'm going to do is we have the first column, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then sixth. So the sixth column. All right. How do I grab that? If I use names of which, that is going to print out the column labels. And then female happens to be the seat one. So if I say names wage, and then if I index in the form of vector notation, you know, index, so square bracket, and I put in six, then that means it is going to fish out the female out for me. Now that I know that the seat item in the names, the column names of the wage data frame is female, 
I just want to replace it with a character gender. So by running this, so I've replaced the female with gender. Let's check the head of the weight once more. And gender is right there. With tidyverse, it would have been much simpler, but we are not doing tidyverse, so I'm not bothering myself in going to tidyverse. Tidyverse is much simpler in those kind of things, all right? So we are going the manual way. Okay. So if it had been tidyverse, we just go to um, rename function, the rename verb, and then we can just change the name of the variable, but I think this is just okay. Then what I want to do is with the gender, if I plot it right now, I know that one represents female and zero represent male. So if one is continuous, one is discrete. So let's pick the wage and let's pick the gender right now. So I'm just going to say ggplot, my data is mapped to wage, is set to wage, and then the aesthetics. Let the X be the discrete, so which is gender. And then the Y, which is going to be the vertical bar. So I'm creating a vertical uh, bar plot. So Y should be set to wage. Then we use the geom core. So that if I run this right now, I'm able to get zero and one. So the number of males and the number of females for the wage. So we can see that if it is one, it's a female. And if it's zero, that is a male. So the males are earning higher wages than females. But zero and one, it's not that informative. So why don't I change the labels from zero, one to male and female? I think that would be much better. So the way to do this is, now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab the wage, the wage data frame, and then let's grab the gender variable. Because everything I'm going to do there has to be stored into that same column. Then I'm going to use the if else function. Now the if else accept three arguments. The first one is the condition or the test. And then the second one is what should be done if the test is true. And the third argument is what should be done if the test is false. So let me give that test or the condition according to the labels there. So if else, wage gender equals one, then assign it a value of female. Otherwise, give it a value of male. So I'm using the if else function. So if you go to the wage data frame, there is a gender variable. If that gender variable, any value equals one, set it to female, otherwise set it to male. So if I go ahead and run this now, and I check the head of wage again, the first few observations, then I can see that that has been implemented. Female, male, female, male. So that if I run this again, now I have my labels right here, female and male. This is very much informative. This is much better than the first one. So we can see clearly that the males receive higher wages than the females. Um, somebody said to repeat it again. Pardon? Uh, somebody in the chat is saying to repeat it again. Frank said to repeat again. Should I go through again? Yeah. All right. Okay. So what we are doing right here is initially the column was named as female because the, according to the label from the data frame, um, Woodridge said if, it is, if it equals one, that is a female. So anytime you see zero, that is a male. So first of all, I needed to change the, the name of the column to gender. That is much more informative so that 
the value labels there, which is uh, the value 0101, I can now assign zero to male and one to female. So that, the, like what we just did right here on the screen. So the way to do this is you just take your data frame, which is weight, and then the dollar sign allows you to access the column headers in the data frame. So I selected the gender variable, which is this one right here. Then I used a function called if else, if else, the if else accept three argument, the test yes and no. Yes means if this test is true, then implement this. If it is false, then go to the no. So what I'm doing is wage gender, if it is, if it equals one, then yes, female. Otherwise, no, give it male. So, you know, earlier on, I said, whenever you are writing code, like the data, the X and the Y, you can choose to omit those argument names because they follow in that order, all right? So you can choose to omit the argument names. And that is exactly what I've done here. But if I was, I were to be writing this explicitly, I would have said gender will be if else, the test is the name of the argument. So what is the test? The test is that if wage gender, so the gender in the wage data frame, if it equals one, then the second argument is yes. Yes, what? If it is yes, if the test is yes, it is true, then make it a female. The no argument is that make it a male if the test fails to be true. So all I have done is just to clear the argument names from up here. So what I've written up here is the same thing I've done here. So these are the three arguments, the tests, the yes, and the no. So the test is that if wage gender equals one, yes, make it a female, no, then make it a male. So that's what I've just done it here, as simple as it can be. So, so I have a question here. If yeah. you go back to the uh, to the main table, for example, yeah. wage, education, and so on. Yeah. The, in the main table, we have male and female follow uh, uh, preceded by zero, all the female and males. How did you assign one or zero to the variable like wage gender or something like that? Yeah, all right. So this is what happens. Now, if I grab the data frame and then, um, okay, let me use another one. Uh, so the head of which, all right, um, this is married, okay. So let me change this one to marital status, all right. So let's change the column name to marital status. So this is what I want to do. So wage, and then I'll grab, so first of all, the names of wage that would display the column labels. And I'm targeting this married. And that happens to be the seventh item. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seventh item. So index on the seven, and that brings out the married, of course. Once I've done that, I want it to be replaced with marital, I think this is okay, marital status like this. So by running this and check the head of the data frame, then we have seen that it is now marital status. Now, if I say wage dollar, marital status and run. It is going to display a vector of all the values contained in that column, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Now look at what happens. If I say the marital status in wage equals one, then it is going to take each value in that column and compare 
to see whether truly it equals one. If that position where it is one, it will report it as true. Wherever it is okay. false, it means the value there was zero. So if you execute this, you have seen the logical values, true, false, true, false. So wherever it is true, that means there was a value one. So if you compare with, let me make this one a little bit bigger. So the first value is zero. So we are saying that it will start with the first value. Is zero equal to one? No, then it is false. Okay, the second value is one. It compares again. Is it equal to one? Yes, then it is true, right? So if I go ahead and say, let me come down here. If I go ahead and say, if else, the test is that go into the waste data frame and bring out the marital status and establish to see whether it's equal to one. This part where it is equal to one will now be displaying true, false, true, false, true, false, like what is shown up here. So the idea is that wherever it evaluates to true, just simply make it married. Okay, so the second argument is what should be evaluated <clears throat> if the first test there is true. So wherever it evaluates to true, make it married. Wherever it evaluates to false, that means that value there is zero, then make it single. So if I execute this now, I am going to get single married, single married, single married, single married, single married. So, so last question. All right. The, this zero and one is like a binary system. It's like a binary previous, system, yeah. Is it, is it previously built in, in, the, in the code or we can assign another code? Yeah, we can assign another code. Like for example, instead of zero and one, we can assign like a four, five, something like that. Exactly. So you can just make it four for single and five for married. Okay. Perfect. So if you were using that four, five kind of value labels, then by creating a bar plot of this sort, here is going to be labeled as, for instance, four. If that is, okay, um, this is married kind of thing. So unless we have to uh, create a bar plot of that. So let me just go up here a little bit and say uh, DG plot where my data equals which, then I set the aesthetics, X would be the which. Okay, let's make it the, uh, the marital status now. But actually I have made it single, married, single, married. Okay, just a, just a minute, I will, I will do something. So X is the marital status, and then Y is the which, and then the GM call. So by running this, now I am able to determine how many are married and how many are single. Actually, um, if you look at the code that I ran here, I just implemented the condition and where it equals one, make it married, where it equals zero, make it single, but I have not replaced the original data frame. All right, so that is why I still see the zero and the one, and that was the label that was given. So we see the zero and the one. Now I want to change it to four and five, all right? So what I'm going to do is, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, take the wage data frame and then let's grab the marital status like that. If else, now at this point, it is zero and one, all right? One for married, zero for single. So I'm going to say, if the wage marital status equals one, set it to the value of four. That means four is married. Okay, let's make it five. Four, five is married and four is single. So if it equals one, set it to five. If not, set it to four. So we know four is single, five is married. So if I run this line of code, and then we check the first few observations of the data frame, then you can see we have the four, five, four, five labeling. So if I rerun the code to create the 
bar chart. Now, what do we see? We see four and then we see five. Oh. Exactly. So oh. usually they want to make it very easy. So they normally use the zero one zero one. All right. Oh. Uh -huh. One means the present attribute and zero means absent. So at the end of the day, now that it is four and five, I'm now going to change the four to single, five to married. So this is what I'm going to do. So wage data frame, I grab the marital status. If else, again, then I give the test. The test is that if the wage marital status equals four, then make it single. Come on. Otherwise, make it married. Execute. Now, let's check the head of the data frame again. Single, married, single, married. So at this point, if I create the bar chart again, then I now have the label single and married. It is taking longer than usual. Oh. So the main point of data manipulation. Yeah. Uh, the running, the running. Good. So now we can see that the, the, the couple, the couple are, are the ones earning higher wages than, the, than, than those who are single. So those who are married are earning higher wages than those who are single, All right? So um, when it comes to the recoding of the values and all those sort of things, it comes down to further data analysis and data manipulation, All right? So I believe that uh, with time, we'll, we'll be having such lessons yeah, yes, in, in the process, so we can familiarize ourselves with all these data manipulation skills and those things. So how to handle data, how to manipulate data. If data is in this format, I want to change it to this format, how to do that. And I think the best choice is to go with tidyverse. This is the base hours process, right? The tidyverse would have been much simpler. So with time, we'll come back to all those sort of, um, <clears throat> how we can do that in the tidyverse. Okay. So I mentioned earlier in the slide that instead of the Zoom call, you can also use the Zoom bar, but this time around, you need to specify the start argument to identity. So um, let's grab the same code. And then I am going to change this one to the Zoom bar. Assuming I do not specify the start equals identity and just say Zoom bar, it will tell you that it only needs one aesthetic it can only have an X or Y aesthetic. That is why you have to set it to start equals identity. That is to override the fact that we are giving it one aesthetic, but two aesthetics. So you are forcing R to create a bar chart, but let one of the variables be mapped to the X axis and the other to the Y axis and give me my bar chart forcefully. So the start there is part of the statistics layer of the ggplot two layers, okay? So that is also another uh, level, okay? That is why that is why I initially gave the Zoom call, all right? So if you know this, that is just okay. Otherwise, if you wanted to use the Zoom bar, it accepts only one aesthetic. If you want to override the fact that the Zoom bar accepts only one aesthetic and should rather accept two aesthetics, then you have to set the start equals identity. When that happens and you execute, you're able to get your bar chart. Okay, so two variables, if they are both continuous, I think one continuous, one discrete. Now we are moving on to the box plot and the violin plot. So here we'll just go straight to the point. So I will just go ahead and grab the same X axis, which is discrete in nature, and then the Y axis, which is also a continuous. So one discrete, one continuous. And let me grab that code and paste it down here. And eliminate the zoom bar, but this time around, we make it zoom box plot. Then I will grab the same code and change the zoom box plot to a zoom violin for the violin plot. 
Let's see how this is implemented. So the box plot first here. So with a box plot, it is usually called the box and whisker plot. Uh, we have some outliers. Any points that you see outside of the box plot itself, they are all referred to as outliers. And so the, the thicker line in the middle of the box represents the median. Um, the lighter lines are the edges of the box. Um, the first one down here happens to be the first quartile. <clears throat> And then the one on top here is the third quarter. Then the base of the line is the minimum point. And then the top of this line is the maximum point, excluding all these outliers. This is the maximum point of the value that is normally represented from the data. And this is the minimum point. So at the end of the day, if we look at the median, so the, the median wage earned by married people are more than wages earned by uh, single persons. So we can see that the married people are still earning more wages than the single, uh, those who are single, right? And then the violin plot also, let's see how that also looks like. So it means that if you have one continuous and one discrete, then you should decide whether you want to use a bar chart, a box plot, or a violin plot. So as a data visualization expert, you have that sort of um, data presented to you. You decide on which one you want to use, and then you can speak to that effect. So later on, once you are able to identify the sort of plot to create, then you will be able to add the, the, the other aesthetics, the color, the shape, the size, and all those kind of things that are needed to make it aesthetically pleasing, right? So this is the violin plot. And if you look at the body side um, where um, that I think should be the median, uh, where the body sides are, you can see if you should bring a line there, it will be above um, the line that will connect the body edges of the violin. And so we can still see that uh, the married people are earning higher wages than those who are single. All right. So by going to the slides, we'll be finishing very soon. We're almost through. Um, there are other graphical primitives, uh, ge geometric primitives, like we have the geom blank, which actually creates nothing, okay? But I did not discuss them into de details over here because uh, we are looking at the choice of graphs that we have to create. We also have uh, a number of them. Uh, let's, let's go further and see, all right? So, now you also have the same two variables, but at least if one of them is discrete. So that means the two variables, you can have both of them being discrete or you can have one of them being discrete. So you can have discrete, at least one discrete means one discrete, it could be continuous, one discrete and the second discrete. So all discrete or one discrete. Then you can also create a count plot or a data plot, right? So. These are the two types of plots that you can also create. So first, um, so two variables, I did not label that here, two variables, at least one discrete. So ggplot, I would want us to use the same um, code that we use up there. So we set it to wage, and then our aesthetics, the x is, our marital status. And then let's set our Y2. Now at this point, it says at least one discrete. So if it is one discrete, one continuous, it qualifies. But it would be much better if it is one discrete, one continuous, you categorically choose to create a bar plot, a violin plot, or a box plot. If it is technically one discrete, one continuous, bar plot, violin plot, box plot. So there at least one discrete, I would prefer it should be two discrete, all right? Two discrete variables. Then you can use the geom count for the count plot and the geom jeta for the jeta plot. So I think that is much better. So here, let me say um, at best two discrete variables. 
at best two discrete variables. So now, if I take a look at the head of the wage data frame, then we have the gender, which is discrete, and the marital status, which is also discrete. So what do we do? Um, okay, so let's say X is marital status and Y is gender. Let's find out what happens. Plus, we add our geom, so it should be geom count. And let's run. If it works, wonderful. Great. So it works. So it gives the counts in the legend. So the legend will just show you that the smaller the points, um, the smaller the count, and the bigger the points, the bigger the count. So we can say that there are more married males than the females. And there are more single females than the males. If you want to give it a value, you can say that um, single males are approximately 100, whereas the single females are 120, if you want to compare to the legend or something. Okay, but technically for a count plot, I think this would be much better to say that there are more married males than there are married females. Okay, and then there are more single females than there are uh, single males. Okay, so that is the count plot. So all we have to do right now is let's change it to a data plot. So by setting our geom layer to geom data and run. And let's see what happens. Mm, okay. So I think the data plot will actually display random, ran, randomly. I think let, let's go and look at the label. I don't want to force myself to say anything I want to say. So it says randomly data overlapping points. All right. So it just places the point just anywhere. So here I believe that we can say the more dense the points are in the space, then all right, something like that. So I can see that there are more points for married males than there are for married females, and there are more points for single females than there are for single males. Okay. So that is also there. And then we'll be wrapping up very soon. So we've practiced that already. So two variables, oh, sorry. Um, we have two variables and they show distribution, right? If you want to show the distribution of two variables, then you have to use the geom hex and the geom bin to the geom density, but they must be continuous in nature. So I think um, I would rather want to guide you uh, by setting this to continuous, right? I think that would be much better. It was actually show distribution, but I think if they are continuous, it's, it's much better that way. So if you want to show the distribution, geom hex, heat map, and density plot as well. But it rather takes geom bin 2D, geom density 2D, and the geom hex. So the thing is, there is a, a very good package, which is called the GG core plot. And we have the GG core mat, which is able to draw very nice uh, heat maps. So instead of using some of these uh, default geometries to create those heat maps and those things, uh, they don't look too too good to our liking, right? But at the end of the day, uh, we just need to just show what they are actually. So if the idea is to show distribution of two continuous, if I'm right, if they, if they should all be continuous, right? Um, anyway, let me just say the distribution. Okay, then GG plots. Let's go into the empty cast. And then the aesthetics, let's set the MPG, which is continuous in nature, to the x axis. And then the weight again. So WT. And this time around, why don't we make it geom hex? Because that is one of the geometries in there. So the geom hex for hexagonal heat map. Let's see whether it works out, if it works out. Hmm. Warning message, computation field is start being hex. Okay. So maybe let's seek help from R to understand what was really happening. It divides the plane into regular hexagons, count the number of cases in each hexagon, and then by default, 
maps the number of cases to the hexagon field. Mm, okay. Let's see some of the examples that they have actually used here. So they have a GG plot. They use the diamonds data frame. That is wonderful. They use carat and price. Okay, why don't we inspect to see what nature of variables carat and price are? So the head of diamonds. Carat is continuous in nature and the price is also continuous in nature. Okay. Then geom hex. Okay, that works out. Wow. So I really do not know why this didn't work. Um, but if we go ahead and say GG plot and we use the diamonds, just like it was used in examples. And so, like I said, there are many of the plots that we might not even be using, no, no, no matter what expertise we have in data visualization. Uh, but just that because we are looking at the principles and practice and upon which GG plot 2 was built. Uh, to give you that endless opportunity to create any sort of plot that you want to create. That is why I'm going through all these sort of them. But I know that most of them are not even applicable in real life. Even if they, they, they are, chances are we'll just only be using them 1% of the time. So X is the carat, and then the Y is price, and then we have the geom hex. Let's see what that gives us. That gives us the same computation failed. So there is something wrong somewhere, right? Yes, there is something wrong somewhere. Okay, why don't I use cat? Hmm. Let me make one of them discrete and see. So cat and the geom hex. That also didn't give us any anything. So I think we should just forget about the fact that. <laughs> Uh, this sort of uh, thing is there, maybe, all right? Um, I know that th those are all sort of plots and ggplot2 has provided them, but uh, I'm sorry to say that I did not take the time to go through and see how they all work out, all right? So we are all just experimenting it, most of them for the first time, myself too, most of them is my first time of seeing how they look like, yeah, all right. So I'll just jump over um, these ones and then move straight to one of the most important um, visualizations as well. Um, two variables, if one of them is time and the other is continuous, then definitely we know what a line plot is, time series plot, okay? That is what we are just trying to talk about it. So one is time and one is continuous, so time series. And so uh, for a time series just, plot, just to interrupt you. Pardon? Sorry, just to interrupt you. Uh, so, uh, sorry, just to interrupt you. Somebody in the chat, Frank, suggested that did you install the hex bin first because it worked for him. Maybe we need to install hex bin first and then geome hex will work. He's saying that. All right. Okay. So if we look at the warning message, that is being displayed after running this sort of code uh, by trying to create a hex, a hexagonal heat, heat map. Um, I think they did not specifically mention a package, but that they said it failed in start being hex. Now I know that the start being hex is part of the statistics layer of the GG plot, right? So it's if you assignment in the bracket, I think. Pardon? There may be some specific assignments between the brackets, I think. Exactly. So, so there, there might be something that start being has can do. If I yeah, go ahead and some, say uh, small start argument. being hex here, and if we seek help, what does it do? Frank is saying that package hex bin is required or start bin hex. Okay. <clears throat> you, you notice that I'm not getting that sort of information here. All right. So, okay, let's try. Let's go to packages. So we are all learning and it's, it's really wonderful. It's really wonderful. So let's see if there is a package hex bin. Good. And then let's install it.
And then we can try to recreate the plot and see what is going to happen. Can you also uh, name write the name of the packages that you mentioned for heat map? The two Absolutely. packages. So um, I am installing the package now. I want it to finish and then we'll rerun the code. If it works, then I will add it to the packages in there. So in the meantime, let me just proceed. So the two variables, if one of them is time and the other is continuous, then we would likely use a line plot, an area plot, or a step plot. We'll demonstrate that very soon. So once that is done, let me load it. So library hex bin. And let's try to recreate the plots. Um, let's go to the carat and price, the one that they use in the example, and then geom hex. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that suggestion. All right. So then I had no right to clear that away from. So let me bring it in. Show distribution. So we would have the GG plot. All right, like this. Great. So let me say requires the installation of hexbin package. So install the packages. Let me bring it right here, hexbin, and then use the library to load it. Hexbin, like that. So let me grab this and bring it down here. Good. So that if you have the script, you know that you have to install this package and load it before you can create your hex bin. And it creates that hex bin for us. So the count, it means that, um, let me grab this one to the left a little bit. So we have thousand has the deeper blue color and 5,000 the lighter blue. So between price and carat, all I know is there is a positive relationship right here. It's some sort of, if we try to, um, let, let's grab the same thing, okay? And let me show you something. And change this one from geom hex to geom point. So a scatter plots. And you see it follows the same kind of, you see how the points are distributed between these two uh, variables. And it's the same kind of thing, just that this one is a hex and it is up to us to go and find out how to really interpret what that hex kind of thing uh, is all about. Let me rerun it. Oh, okay. Because there, there are 53,940 observations for the diamonds uh, data frame. That is why sometimes it takes a longer time before displaying the plot. Yeah. It nearly displayed it, and I don't know what happened. So let me just widen the window and rerun. OK. If that is becoming stubborn, then let's go to the empty cars where we have fewer. Um, and the current price will all continue. So MPG and the Y equals the weight like we we're doing at first, and then the geom hex. Could there be too much information in my system? Maybe becoming, we can proceed further. We don't know. Yeah, it is becoming very slow. I want, let me clear all my history. Okay. Uh, in the meanwhile, can you just write the names of the package for heat map in the chat so that we can install it? Yeah. Um, if you wanted to create a heat map, then um, you have to install. So install the packages. Uh, GG core plots. Yeah, this should be the package. Then you load it as well. So library. Actually, 
we cannot see the screen fully, I think. Okay, so I guess yeah, sure the poll. Yeah, I guess uh, our studio is is giving me some problems here. Uh, I think by just trying to create the scatter plots alongside the hex, I think it's taking too much memory. So that is why it's happening so. Yeah, clearing history and removing some figure takes too much time. Yeah, so I'm even clearing the history and it's taking too much time in doing that. It's still loading at my end. So if someone can write down the name of the package, please. Yeah. Yep. I think this, this one might be consuming too much memory. Um, I should have used the few of the missions. Our session aborted. Okay, let's start a new session. I hope I don't lose all, all that I've done. You can have already run that with the cloud. You can go come back to the plots. All right, so let's proceed. I think even I was doing that, but I think there might be just too much information to display in a small window. But at least we now know that the hexagonal heat map works. Yeah, we know that it works. So two variables, one time, one continuous. Um, let's see whether we have that sort of information in the diamonds data frame. We do not have any time element there. Okay, not in empty cars. What about the wage? I'm not sure it is in the wage. Oh, okay. I have now made it wage one. Okay, there's no time component. Um, what data frame has time component? Okay, there is a data frame called MPG. Let me find out. MPG, 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 manufacturer model. Yeah, we have year here, here. So um, let's include one more data frame for the time component. So let me just come up here. Uh, so import MPG. Uh, data frame from, I think that is also base R, like that. So that means data and then MPG. Yeah. Okay. So now I can just come down here and let's look at the head of MPG. And then it has the time component, which is the year variable here. And let's look at the displacement over time. So one, one time and then one continuous. Two variables, one is time, one is continuous. And so the time component is year, and then the continuous is displacement. So we just go ahead and say GG plots, and our data is MPG, and then the aesthetics x equals the year which is the time and then y equals the continuous variable which is displ and then we create a line plot by using the geom line now we we'll use the same sort of information and this time around we create the area plots and then we create the step plots so those were the three figures the three plots that we said we could create when one of them is time and then one of them is also continuous. So let's look at the line plots. Mm. This is not supposed to happen. Because time series plot looks like this. There is one data frame I know this is what we call time series. And we have the year component right here. And then we have the value. So like that, this is what we call the line plot. Unless of course, why don't I check the type of data for the year class? Because I really don't understand that. It's an integer, hmm. an integer. Why don't we make it 
a date component. I think there is as dot date function. Yes. Functions to convert between character representations and objects of class dates representing calendar dates. Okay, I think this might work. So let me come up here and write this function for you. So year, like that, so that when you check it, it is an integer. Then let's grab the year variable and then let's render it as a date object. Okay, and let's pass in the year variable again so that we replace it with the existing one. Error as the date of numeric origin must be supplied. Hmm. Uh, okay, this is where a package called Lubridate, part of the tidyverse, would have come in. So library. Um, Lubridate. Then let me do that again and see if it works. I will add it to the code. If it doesn't, we have to look for another uh, data frame that will do what we want it to do for us. So we have the year, yeah. MPG and the year. Let's make it a year. Let's see. Error again. Okay, what if I make it year, month, day? Hmm, no format found. All right, I, I think I'm having um, issues with uh, making this one. Let me see the head. So it has rendered everything any, okay. It has corrupted everything. So we have to import the data again. So data MPG. It is good because even as programmers, there are a lot of times we struggle a lot. We really, really struggle, but we are doing our very best. Okay. But the geom line is what you gave us. That's not what we wanted. The area. No, nope. and this is the step. No. Or maybe the DISPL wasn't the right choice. Okay, what if I make it HWY? Let's see. HWY, Yum line. So, okay. Um, I believe you have seen the kind of difficulty I'm going through right now. Yeah, so one of them is time and the other is continuous. Uh, but this one was rendered as an integer. It has to be a time component. Anyone who can help? Yeah, a time series plot, exactly. Uh, but I wanted us to use the GG plot um on a data frame you you know search the help to write down time series plot i think pardon i mean we can search in the the help tab for the time series plot how to plot the time series in the in the, in the help pane thank you so much thank you so much sometimes you get so confused the mind has just blocked its way into thinking <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So let's check the geom line and see what example they even used. So um, geom line, they've given, given us geom path. Okay, let's go down. So we have the geom step here, the geom line there. Okay, so examples down there. Okay, this is what they did. They created their own data frame. Um, let me go up here. Okay, okay, there is a data frame called economics. Let's see if it is in there. Economics, economics, oh, in ggplot 2 wonderful. So instead of using the MPG, I'll come back to this. And 
all these must be cleared instead of using npg. So I guess I should go up here and where we we're importing our data. So we rather import economics. So from ggplot 2 import economics from ggplot 2 great. So now that we have the economics, we can just come here and then check the first few observations of economics. Good, so we have the date component and then unemployed, unemployment, good, unemployment. So we can just go ahead and say ggplot and then our data is economics. Then with the aesthetics, we set S equals to date and then the Y equals to unemployment. So unemployed plus then geom line. <clears throat> and let's run this and see what happens. Wonderful. Nice time series. This is what we are struggling to do. I'm struggling to do, right? That is why after having to know all of these things and I walk around and people see me smiling, yes, I tell them I know R. It is not easy. R is not an easy thing at all. So that is the line plot that we are looking at. Wonderful. Okay. So time series plots. It, the so line is simply the time series plot. Yeah. If you have time, the small question here if you are able to change the time variable, for example, the, the interval is 10 years, how can we change to, let's say, five, the interval would be five years, three years, something like that. Is it there any possibility to change it, a function? If you know, please. Otherwise, just skip it. Yeah, um, I think in ggplot, I will find it really difficult, but in time series modeling, um, it can be done because there is a function called the TS. So time series model is another um, field. Okay, the TS is a time series object where you pass in your data and then you specify the start. So for instance, maybe 1990, uh, and then you can specify an end. There is an end argument somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, it hasn't shown yet, but yes, there is an end here. So maybe in the year 2000 or whatever, and then you can specify the frequency. So this yeah. one here means one year, all right? Yeah, that's like an uh -huh. interval. The yeah. interval, exactly. So one year, you can change it to five, then that is five years interval. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you can just experiment with that by using the TS and just pass in any data, any vector of data that you can pass in. And just specify a start as, let's say 1900, and then say frequency equals five, and you see, 1900, 1905, 1910, like that, until the data is exhausted. But my question is uh, how to assign this uh, parameter inside the job step or the ggplot data? We have to assign this parameter. Okay, so I think that is where I have not really taken a look at, at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe later on, we can just go through and find out what sort of. Yeah arguments are in there and see if there, yeah. there is a possibility to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. So that was our line plots. And if we make it an area plot, uh, it's just going to shade the, the regions, okay? So it's just going to give a shading of that. So that is just the area, okay? And sometimes, uh, yeah, I think it's when you are doing that for um, for areas, countries, or sometimes you are plotting not just one series, maybe two series, and you wanted to show the area they cover. You can also use the geom area and color them by that. If we are going further deep into some of those aesthetics, the color in those things, then that could have been done. But so far, you have seen the area plot and the line plot. And then the step plot will also give it in a stair like kind of, you know. It's almost similar to that of the geom line. Uh, there is not much difference here. <clears throat> yeah, 
there's not much difference just that i think this one has a deeper line so the steps because the the figures i think that there are yeah 574 observations so the figures are so compact you cannot see the step okay aha uh -huh. the steps are there so if we were to be limiting the axis maybe we could have seen that clearly using the cold cartesian kind of but that's another layer in ggplot right we can zoom into the graph yeah but i think that is beyond the scope for this lesson and i think we are ending our lesson with displaying uncertainty and then we are done even that one uh these ones are beyond our scope okay two variables you want to create a, a map then you can use the geo map um that one you need to have longitude and latitude okay so uh that that is for map work uh -huh, of course if you want to know they call it what a spatial analysis spatial analysis yeah that is also another field on its own spatial analysis then we learn how to create maps and there are more powerful packages that have been created to do that for us and then if you have three variables we can create contours <clears throat> and those things so you can just um seek help from r so just type help function and pass in the geom contour and then execute so it will give you the examples down there you can just look at how the code has been implemented in creating uh, the contour plot and then you can just come and demonstrate that in the r studio right so i think um the display of uncertainties like i said there are so many geometries we've not even finished covering all of them there are tons of them all right like just like even here we have the geom step i can even copy the same thing and there is a primitive geometry called the geom blank which actually says don't plot anything all right just don't plot anything so geom blank and that's all so it will give you your x-axis scales y-axis scales, but there's no visual element Okay, so there are some of these default um, geometries yeah. there that you can use. I think now, now everybody knows the basic. They can practice on their own. Yeah, you can just share the script and uh, the yeah. PowerPoint presentation if it is possible. So I think we learn basics now. Rest they can practice by their own. Yeah. So um, yeah. I think we'll bring our meeting to an end. I will share the slides to you um and then i will share the slides first because that is what is readily available at the moment so i'll share the slides and i will share the the scripts as well so the very last question elijah if, I, okay. uh, if you if you don't okay. mind uh i would appreciate i'm not sure if you have time or this month or next month if you can present another presentation or seminar like that or lecture on uh, the data and like a ANOVA one-way and two-way multivariable uh, yes 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 um he, like uh, we will be having these kind of fundamental conceptual lessons as well as coding like for every topic like for tidy words for statistics for everything we are planning like that uh, very soon we are going to share the outline as well that what we have planned and if the and if people continue supporting us we have advanced sessions as well where we will learn data analysis machine learning as well but if people keep on joining us then we will be able to go to that as well so okay. like yeah okay 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 so um thank you very much isvin and then thank you very much everyone for attending this meeting it's been nice knowing you and i i, I hope it's not going to end here we are just going to continue uh, this sort of relationship so thank you very much